Welcome back to a video commentary of Marathon Phoenix. Uh, my name is Ryoko TK. We are watching episode 7, Vampire Killer. Uh, in contrast to the previous level, Shades of Grey, this level is totally different. It is a very linear hell gauntlet of difficult fights. Uh, recording this episode took like two hours because of how often I was dying and losing progress. And I had to re-record several times because the file was getting too big. Uh, this level's objective is very straightforward. All you have to do is reach the end. Uh, there are two hurdles. Well, really, there's only one hurdle, and that's that you need a key card in order to open all these doors. Uh, once you get the key card, you have pretty much free access to most of the map. Uh, you also have to um, flood part of the level with, uh, with water or sludge or whatever. You have to flood the level in order to gain access to a couple of ledges that you couldn't access before. Um, but, like I said, it's a very linear level, so all these gateways pretty much, um, they, uh, they sort of present themselves to you. And, uh, this was, design was very intentional, uh, the contrast against Shades of Grey. Shades of Grey, as you'll remember from the previous episode, is a very non-linear exploration-based level, with, uh, pretty mild combat relative to the rest of Phoenix, anyway. And it's not really that hard, it's a pretty quiet level overall. Uh, this level is... Uh, a very action-packed uh, series of set pieces uh, as they uh, sort of progress around this facility. Uh, in that regard, it's maybe not the most creatively designed level, but I think I execute the, uh, the sort of linear set piece structure uh, thoroughly enough that I get away with it still seeming like it's uh, a real place, or at least a, a plausible place in a good level overall. Uh, this is one of my favorites, even though it is goddamn tough. Um, and there is a sequence break I'm going to actually show off after I'm done with the normal playthrough of this level. There is a secret exit to this level, and that's what we're going to go for here. Uh, in keeping with the tradition of the rest of Chapter 2, this one introduces uh, new renegade enemies in the uh, upgraded and revamped fighters. Um, fighters, four fighters, vanilla fighters, are extremely non-threatening trash enemies. And in order to sort of keep them in uh, keep them in line with other renegade enemies, it was sort of difficult to de redesign them in a way that was, you know, reasonable and challenging without just being boring. Um, Simply making them, you know, have more health so that they don't fall over so easily wasn't going to do anything, um, because their attacks are so easy to dodge and so telegraphed, and, um, you know, making them just do more damage wasn't really the right answer either. So what I had to do was redesign their attacks and redesign their behavior in a way that made them, um, just more threatening in general. Um, melee fighters, their attack animation is um, pretty much halved. Uh, in vanilla, uh, it's very easy to juke a melee fighter's attack because there's a, like a sound and a wind-up. So even if they do get close enough to you, you hear that sound effect and you can take a couple steps to dodge and you're not going to get hit. So uh, melee fighters are very non-threatening. And ranged ones, uh, those shots, their projectiles don't travel that quickly, so it's, you get a lot of time to dodge them. Um, and for the ranged attacks, they just travel much more quickly, as you've probably seen already. Um, still dodgeable, uh, otherwise they follow the same behavior. Uh, they hurt just as bad as they used to. Um, the damage is actually okay. Um, and it's just harder to dodge those ranged attacks, because of course they travel more quickly. You just need better reflexes than you needed to before. But, and they do have slightly more health, um, but that's just because they were so easy to kill. Uh, they're still easy to kill, but it's, it takes just a little more effort, and that slightly longer time frame gives them another chance to attack you. We're coming up in the first part of the objective here, which is uh, to flood the, flood the level. It's going to help us reach that ledge, which you can see right there. When I designed the renegade enemies, I, um, I had to address 
the issue of monster ranks differently than I did before. For those of you that aren't aware of how marathon enemies work, um, almost all of them are divided, almost every enemy has multiple ranks, like a major rank and a minor rank. And the only real difference between ranks is like how much health they have and maybe how um, good their AI is at tracking it and so forth. And maybe how many projectiles they shoot per volley. And it's just that sort of bigger numbers thing that I was talking about in a much earlier episode. Um, the boring way of making enemies more threatening. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it works okay in vanilla the, because the enemies are at least visually distinct, so you get a broader color palette. For instance, there's four types of fighters. Um, there's green and purple ones, which are your melee ones. Purples are the major rank, and greens are the minor rank. The only difference between them is that the purple ones have double the health. Um, and then the range fighters, there's orange ones, which are the minor ranks, and blue ones, which are the major ranks. And the only difference there is that the blue ones shoot two shots per volley instead of one. It's uh, That's not very interesting to me. Especially because one of the key differences in difficulties is that um, if you play on a higher difficulty than normal, uh, some monsters are elevated or some promoted from minor ranks to major ranks. If you play on Total Carnage, all enemies are major ranks. And if you play on a low difficulty, some major enemies are demoted to minor. And then on top of that, uh, they get additional attribute boosts, um, like more health and more damage. Uh, is you know not very interesting that there's there's more potential there so instead I have uh, my enemies instead of major and minor ranks they have slightly different behavioral styles um, so you already saw that with the defenders there's the green ones which shoot the, the easily dodged green beams and then you have the red defenders which shoot the deadly burst uh, but if you talk about fighters um, the, the projectile fighters um, some of them will stand in place and plink at you from a distance, and other ones will um, they will shoot aggressively and then they will kind of approach. Uh, that's more in keeping with vanilla uh, fighter behavior. And it kind of works the same way with other enemies. Um, like hunters, uh, the lighter gray hunters will... Uh, they will they move a little quicker, they shoot shorter volleys, and they are more likely to try to get closer to you, whereas the darker gray ones, they will engage you from a distance. Um, and so that just adds a little bit more flavor. Um, it's not probably not very easy to tell that there is a difference at all, but you know, it was more interesting that way than just having a rank difference. Anyway, now that I have the card key, I can uh, open this door. You'll notice that we're at the start of the level again. Um, but now that the level's flooded, I can swim up to the sledge, and now that I have the card key, I can open the door and I can uh, finish out the level. So like I said, pretty linear level, um, just a lot of set pieces in a row. Uh, since I edited out all the deaths, you can't really uh, get a good grasp of how uh, tricky some of these fights are. Uh, this is the first time in the level that you're kind of outside, um, and sort of the, the, the viewpoint and the, the perspective that brings it all together. Uh, because the first part of the level, of course, was in all these um, corridors and these interior areas. And now that we're outside, you know, you can see that there's a, uh, you know, you can, you can see that there's a series of buildings here. You can kind of get a good grasp of how the pieces come together. And, uh, of course, you get all these good long views, uh, long shots for the crossbow. Uh, you get a good mix of long-range enemies, like that fighter on that ledge, but also there's these troopers right here. Um, so, you know, monster placement is, of course, pretty important for making uh, for making these fights as tricky as possible. I, uh, I do, I, um, in an earlier video, of course, I, I kind of talked down about levels that are sort of linear and straightforward. Um, you know, modern games tend to have their level design like this, uh, where it's just sort of a, the, the theme park ride, where you go from point to point and you 
they don't really tie it together very well. Uh, if you do execute it well, of course, uh, there's a lot to be said about it, um, because uh, you have total control over the pacing. Uh, the player is not going to get lost, and you know what angle uh, the player is going to approach uh, each set piece from, and it um, helps you. It, it's a it's a theme park ride. A good theme park ride, of course, is um, every every moment of that ride is engineered. So a good linear level takes a lot of engineering, and this is definitely true in this level, um, where each fight is tricky, but tricky in a different way. And I try not to uh, try not to repeat the same ambush in, in the same sort of set piece or style of set piece. And uh, kind of interestingly is that. Even though this is a linear level, it's uh, actually kind of a little bit longer. I think it takes about 13 minutes in this recording where I edited out all the deaths. So, you know, so that's pretty good. Just, uh, just scooping up the last secret down here. using um, using uh, enemies like defenders lets me have situations or uh, sort of set pieces like this where I can um, have them engage you from an area that's sort of inaccessible to you and in this case I'm having them fly over that pit uh, I guess you could fall into the pit but there's nothing there or having them fly down from these shafts in the ceiling so nothing is safe and um, yeah, that's kind of, I like that part about Phoenix. I am um, always trying to challenge you from different directions. And I'm kind of getting kind of keyed up here at the end of this playthrough um, because uh, I was really starting to get frustrated. So this last defender uh, almost got the better of me, and I was going to be pretty frustrated. Uh, that's actually the end of the level. That shaft right there um, takes you to the next level, um, the next main level, which is the Great Cave Offensive. But I'm going to head to the secret exit instead. And after, like I said earlier, after I uh, show you the secret exit this way, I'm actually going to retread through this level and uh, show you how to sequence break it. Because it is possible to clear this level in about three minutes. Or maybe about four minutes. But, um... I guess I'll use this opportunity to actually talk about designing uh, shortcuts and designing alternate routes through your levels. Um, it is a very, it is very tempting as a level designer to sort of uh, shuttle your, your, shuttle the player through every part of the level. You know, to make it so that you have to exp have to see everything, because you spent all this time making the level. You don't want the player to not see it, right? I mean, I don't. So. It's very tempting to make a level, especially like a non-linear level, like uh, Shades of Grey. And it's very tempting to make a level like that and then have it so that there's something that you need to see in every room. So that you, you know, you do, the player does see everything that you spent so much time on. Um, but in this case, I did make a shortcut. Uh, this was actually originally the only way to reach the secret exit, but I changed it because I uh, got rid of all permanently missable secrets. I am kind of proud of, of this one, or sort of pleased by it, because it's kind of clever. And uh, if you had already played through this level the normal way, it's uh, it's a cool subversion. And I think that when you're talking about a shortcut or a sequence break that you're building into a level, uh, you, you want to subvert the experience that you set up previously. Uh, so that door that I was looking at right there, I'm going to open it uh, with a very carefully hidden switch. Uh, and I'm... And uh, that door, opening that door, allows me to completely skip having to flood the level. Uh, that switch right there, um, after you flood the level, the switch is disabled. You can't open this door. So uh, while playing the game normally, you might see it, see that the switch is disabled, and wonder, you know, what do I have to do? Well, that's what you have to do. You have to shoot it from the start.
And then uh, you'll notice that we're up here in the key card area, even though it's from the opposite angle. I kind of, I kind of uh, got one up by those troopers earlier, so I'm taking this slowly. Even though, you know, you don't want to have a short, you don't want to spend the time making shortcuts, letting players skip the stuff that you made, I think it's kind of important in terms of the overall product to have that sort of stuff involved, because it makes it, it gives it a little bit, uh, it's, it's cool, and it, it sort of rewards the player for exploring, because uh, certain players only see a game as, like, the only way that the game is beaten. The only point of playing the game is to finish the game. And so when you include a shortcut um, that gets them that much closer to finishing the game or finishing the level, that feels like a win to them. To me, I always want to explore every level that I play. So it wouldn't be a win to me, but it it's still kind of cool. Uh, still, a, still a necessary component of level design. Not all the time. Um, unless you're trying to make a game that's speedrunnable, I suppose. Anyway, now that I have the key card, I'm actually able to open the door that uh, the tr those troopers are guarding. After you flood the level, that door is inaccessible. Uh, Shutter kind of locks it off, so you cannot ap uh, approach the secret from this direction. Uh, since we're coming up this way with the key card, um, you don't ever flood the level, which means you don't go over there, so you don't have to shoot the switch. You're just right here, and you're already able to exit. That's the end of Vampire Killer. The next video is going to have two levels, so stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching, and uh, take care.